Chapter 2. The Long Path As a Preparation If the grace of the over-self is to take hold of the man, no part of his ego ought to offer resistance. This is why a preparation for the event is needed, a process of taking out of him those things which are certain to instigate such resistance. In other words, the activity of the long path is necessary to the successful treading of the short path. It would be wonderful if everyone, everywhere, could slip so easily into the kingdom of heaven and just as easily stay there forever. But alas, the facts of human nature forbid it. People require teaching, training, purifying, disciplining, and preparing before they can do so. And the course needed is a lifetime's the work needed, much and varied. That is why the long path is needed. The purification which he is to seek through the long path is not the narrow, limited, and intolerant kind which too often is called by this name. It is not at all merely a harsh denial of the sexual instinct. It is a cleansing of consciousness of his thought life, his emotional life, and even of his bodily condition. Its aim is to prepare his consciousness so that it can receive the truth without deflecting or warping or blocking it. Inevitably, the most important work and always the most difficult work along this line will be the elimination of the ego's tyranny. Every negative thought and base desire is an obstacle to the attainment of the higher consciousness. This is why the long pass work is needed for it is intended to remove all such obstacles. How can one invite that consciousness to dwell in a body enslaved by lust, or in a mind darkened by hates? Although the possibility of this discovery and awareness of over-self and establishment in it has always been with every man at every moment, the probability has not, for he has to develop the equipment of maturing from animal through man's gathered experience to this full establishment, in full union with this highest being. The savage may get the glimpse and does, but this is only a beginning, not an end. The teaching favored by Indian metaphysicians, that we came from God and shall return to God, which generally leads to misunderstanding. Then all this long pilgrimage, with all its sufferings, becomes a senseless waste of time an idiotic expenditure of energy. If not on our part, then on God's. It is like banging one's head against a wall in order to enjoy the relief which follows when the action ends. Through lack of a cosmogony, the proponents of this teaching are compelled to explain away the purpose of all this vast universe as non-purpose, using the term Maya, one of whose two meanings is mystery. The infinite being, whose consciousness and power is behind the universe of history, can itself have no history, for it is beyond time, evolution, change, development, can have no purpose which is gainful to itself, cannot be made the object of human thought correctly because it utterly transcends the limitations of such thought. But all this is not to say that the world mind's activity is meaningless, idealist, and fruitless. The very contrary is the case. Students who have come finally to philosophy from the Indian Advaita Vedanta bring with them the belief that the divine soul, having somehow lost its consciousness, is now seeking to become self-conscious again. They suppose the ego originates and ends on the same level, divinity, and therefore the question is often asked, why it should go forth on such a long and unnecessary journey. This question is a misconceived one. It is not the ego itself, which ever was consciously divine, but its source, the over-self. The ego's divine character lies in its essential but hidden being, but it has never known that. The purpose of gathering experience, the evolutionary process, is precisely to bring it to such awareness. The ego comes to slow birth and finite consciousness out of utter unconsciousness and later to recognition and union with its infinite source. That source, 
whence it has emanated, remains untouched, unaffected, ever knowing and serenely witnessing. The purpose in this evolution is the ego's own advancement. When the quest is reached, the overself reveals its presence fitfully and brokenly at first, but later the hide and seek game ends in loving union. Nearly everyone would most likely choose a way which evaded all the long discipline of thought and feeling, all the stern reform of bodily habits, and yet brought him swiftly to the goal and gave him in full its glorious rewards. This choice is pardonable and seemingly sensible, but observation and experience, study and research, show that such a way exists only in theory, not in factuality. That its dramatic successes are the rare cases of a very few geniuses. That those who take this seemingly easy and short road mostly arrive, if they arrive at all, at a state of intellectual intoxication and pseudo-illumination, and that where their reward for this short path practice is a genuine glimpse, they wrongly believe it to be the end of the road and cease all further effort to grow. Those who believe in the short path of sudden attainment, such as the following of Ramana Maharshi and the Kohen, puzzled intellectuals of Zen Buddhism, confuse the first flash of insight which unsettles everything so gloriously with the last flash which settles everything even more gloriously. The disciple who wants something for nothing, who hopes to get the goal without being kept busy with arduous travels to the very end, will not get it. He has to move from one point of view to a higher from many a struggle with weaknesses to the mastery. Then only, when he has done himself what he should do, may he cease his efforts, be still, and await the influx of grace. Then comes light and the second birth. That inspired an excellent little book, Brother Lawrence's The Practice of the Presence of God, is an example of short path teaching. The contemporary biographer of Lawrence writes, He could never regulate his devotion by certain methods as some do. At first he had meditated for some time, but afterwards that went off. All bodily mortifications and other exercises are useless, he thought, but as they serve to arrive at the union with God by love. Now it is all very well for Brother Lawrence to decry techniques and to tell aspirants that his prayer or method was simply a sense of the presence of God. He himself needed nothing more than to attend to what was already present to and existing in him. But how many average aspirants are so fortunate? How many possess such a ready-made sense or feeling? Is it not the general experience that this is a result of long previous toil and sacrifice, an effect and not itself a cause? Many fixations created in the past have to be removed before we can truly live in the present. This is long path work. What or who is seeking enlightenment? It cannot be the higher self, for that is itself of the nature of light. There then only remains the ego. This ego, the object of so many denunciations and denigrations, is the being that transformed will win truth and find reality, even though it must surrender itself utterly in the end at the price to be paid. Another reason for the need of the long past preparatory work is that the mind, nerves, emotions, and body of the man shall be gradually made capable of sustaining the influx of the solar force or spirit energy. As a Limitation there are certain patterns of thought which reflect the idea that attainment of this goal is almost impossible and that the needed preparation and purification should not be even half finished in a whole lifetime. If these patterns are held over a long period of years, they provide him with powerful suggestions of limitation. Thus, the very instruction or teaching which is supposed to help his progress actually handicaps it and emotionally obstructs it. 
his belief that character must be improved, weaknesses must be corrected, and the ego must be fought looms so large in his outlook that it obliterates the equally necessary truth that grace is ever at hand, and that he should seek to invoke it by certain practices and attitudes. The man on the long path reaches a point where he tends to overdo its requirements or to do them in an unbalanced way. He is then too self-conscious, too much ridden by guilt, oscillating between indulgence and remorse. Only when his efforts seem to be futile and his mind to be baffled, only when he gives up an exhaustion, does he give up the tension which causes it. Then, relaxed spontaneity released, the gate is at last open for grace to enter. In its light he may see that in one sense he had been running around in circles because he had been running around inside his own ego. The long path, despite its magnificent ideals of self-improvement and self-control, is still egotistic, for this determination to rise spiritually is directed by willed ambition, willed by the higher part of the ego. The processes and procedures of the long path require time, but the over-self is outside of time. To identify yourself with them is to shut yourself out from it. It is consequently needful when a certain point is reached, either in experience or in preparation or in understanding, to abandon the long path and take to the short path, with its emphasis on living in the eternal now. The aspirant who frequently measures how far he has advanced or retrograded upon this path, or how long he has stood still, is seeking something to be gained for himself, is looking all the time at himself. He is measuring the ego instead of trying to transcend it altogether. He is clinging to self instead of obeying Jesus' injunction to deny it. Looking at the ego, he unwittingly stands with his back to the over-self. If he is ever to become enlightened, he must turn round, cease this endless self-measurement, Stop fussing over little steps forward or backward. Let all thoughts about his own backwardness or greatness cease and look directly at the goal itself. The long path keeps the mind continually searching, whether for increased holiness or increased truth. It is never quiet, content at peace. Although the ego claims to be engaged in a war against itself, we may be certain that it has no intention of allowing a real victory to be achieved, but only a pseudo-victory. The simple conscious mind is no match for such cunning. This is one reason why out of so many spiritual seekers, so few really attain union with the over-self. Why self-deceived masters soon get a following, whereas the true ones are left in peace, untroubled by such eagerness. The way of the long path is an effort to abstract him from the bonds of physical appetite and passion which prevent his free thought and balanced feeling. It is an effort of distanglement. But by its very nature, this is only a negative attainment. It must be followed by a positive one, and the latter must enable the man to fulfill life's higher purpose in the midst of human, worldly activity while yet enabling him to keep the freedom he has won through self-discipline. Therein lies the superiority of the short path. He comes in the end to recognize his ineffectiveness and incapacity, to admit that he cannot rightly hope to succeed in the quest by his own efforts or by his own qualities. This may make him unhappy, but it also offers the opportunity to make himself truly humble. At first, he learns that he is personally responsible for his thoughts and actions, for their results in himself and outside it in his destiny. Then, if he accepts this truth, and in the long path works upon it, he is led to the discovery of the short path, and that he is God's responsibility. The end of all his efforts on the long path will be the discovery that although the ego can be refined, thinned, and disciplined. It will still remain highly 
rarefied, and extremely subtle. The disciplining of the self can go on and on and on. There will be no end to it. For the ego will always be able to find ways to keep the aspirant busy in self-improvement, thus binding him to the fact that the self is still there behind all his improvements. For why should the ego kill itself? Yet the enlightenment, which is the goal he strives to reach, can never be obtained unless the ego ceases to bar the way to it. At this discovery, he will have no alternative to and will be quite ready for the short path. Moving from the long to the short path Time will come when you will have to turn your back upon the long path in order to give full attention, the full energy and the full time to the short path. For with this comes a new era when the whole concern is not with the ego, not with its improvement or betterment, but with the divine itself alone. Not with the surface consciousness and all its little changes, but with the very depths, the diviner depths where reality abides. At this point, seek only the higher self. Live only with positive thoughts. Stay only for as long as you can with the holy science within. Feel only that inner stillness, which belongs to the essence of consciousness. Henceforth, you are not to become this or that, not to gather the various virtues, but simply to be. For this you do not have to strive, you do not have to think, you do not have to work with any form of yoga, with any method of meditation. When body and feeling are cleansed by disciplinary regimes, when the intellect is inspired by meditational exercises, one is ready for the short path. When he has reached this stage, you will begin to understand that his further spiritual progress does not impose special acts such as disciplinary regimes and meditation exercises, excellent and necessary though these were in their place as preparatory work, but requires him simply to stand aside and be an observing witness of life, including his own life. The long path is taught to beginners and others in the earlier and middle stages of the quest. This is because they are ready for the idea of self-improvement and not for the higher one of the unreality of the self. So the latter is taught on the short path, where attention is turned away from the little self and from the idea of perfecting it to the essence, the real being. If he keeps on fixing his attention upon fighting the wandering characteristic of his thoughts, he may find, after many attempts, that the task seems impossible. Why is this? It is because, at the same time, he is limiting himself to attention upon the ego. Let him move in the opposite direction and turn to the short path. Let the thoughts fix themselves on the over-self upon its great stillness, its serene impersonality. The ego will not and cannot remove itself by itself, but by going outside to that which is its origin. The thoughts in the end are led into surrender to the power which transcend it and will master it. They are too self-conscious about their work and progress on this quest, their adoption of it and experiences in it. It is only when they leave this long path for the short one that their attitude becomes spontaneous, unstudied, natural, their feelings released from ambition, affection, and egocentricity. They begin to grow as the flower grows, as Mabel Collins puts it. Those who look for advancement by looking for inner experiences or for discoveries of new truth do well, but they need to understand that all this is still personal, still something that concerns the ego even if it be the highest and best part of the ego. The greatest advance will be made when they cease holding the wish to make any advance at all, cease this continual looking at themselves, and instead come to a quiet rest in the simple fact that God is, until they live in this fact alone. That will transfer their attention from self to over-self, 
and keep them seeing its presence in everyone's life and its action in every event. The more they succeed in holding to this insight, the less will they ever be troubled or afraid or perplexed again. The more they recognize and rest in the divine character, the less will they be feverishly concerned about their own spiritual future. There are two different approaches to the task. Both are legitimate. The one belongs to the long path and the other to the short path. The first is forcibly to control the undesirable feelings and thoughts. The second is to seek their source in the ego and by understanding it at this deep level, lose interest in them and turning away, stop continuing to feed them. The way to the goal does not lie through a cleansing of the ego alone. It lies also through a desertion of it. The first way is necessary only because it helps to make the second one possible. Although the two paths are so sharply divided from one another in theory, they not seldom overlap in fact. All the more elementary and religious and occult forms of meditation, including those used on the long path, all that lead to what the Hindu yogis call Savikalpa Samadhi, usually have to be passed through, but one ought not to remain with them. The pure philosophic meditation as ultimately sought and reached on the short path is to put the attention directly on the over-self and on nothing else. If you investigate the matter deeply enough and widely enough, you will find that happiness eludes nearly all men despite the fact that they are forever seeking it. The fortunate and successful few are those who have stopped seeking with the ego alone and allow the search to be directed inwardly by the higher self. They alone can find a happiness unblemished by defects or deficiencies, a supreme good which is not a further source of pain and sorrow, but an endless source of satisfaction and peace. It is an error to believe that men can separate themselves permanently from normal human life, and themselves exist as if they were ghosts. They may succeed in doing so, for a time, a period, sometimes even a lifetime. But in the end, the bipolar forces which control development will draw them back. No such separation is desired or sought on the short path, as it often is on the long one, and those who follow it can appreciate physical or cultural possessions and satisfactions. But because they are spiritually mature, there is always inner detachment behind this appreciation. It is certainly better to remove faults and remedy weaknesses than to leave them as they are. But it is not enough to improve, refine, and noble, and even spiritualize the ego. For all such activity takes place under the illusion that ego possesses reality. This illusion needs to be eliminated, not merely changed for another one. To become their ruler, you must fight desires. This is the harder way. Or you may forget them. This is the easier way. To follow it, you must practice remembering the overself constantly. In this way, he does little to free himself from a weakness, a desire, or a passion. It goes, falls away of its own accord. If he looks to the higher self rather than to the management of his own ego for salvation, it is this spontaneous way, too, that the attitude of detachment begins to appear in his character, and little by little, but sometimes swiftly, becomes established. But a warning is needed here. Whatever purifications or strengthenings, whatever other attempts and trainings at self-betterment he has begun, need not be dropped provided they are kept in their place and not allowed to obscure the view of the primary goal or gradually sidetrack direction from its superior level. It is only on the long path that a man seeks so desperately for truth and insight. All that feverish ambition fades away on the short path, where he learns to hold himself in peace and patience. If the long path begins and ends with ego, the short path begins with a 180-degree turnaround 
opens up a vista of the infinite over self. If the long path equips him with the necessary strength, purity, and concentration, the short path makes use of this equipment to unite his consciousness directly with the over-self. If the long path seeks salvation chiefly through the building of character and the concentration of thought, the short path seeks it chiefly through worshipful meditation directly on the over-self. It is the personal ego which operates the will and tries to bring about the result. This is quite proper and pertinent on the long path practice. But when attention is turned away from it to the short path, it is no longer the will but the higher power which should be looked to for the result. On the long path his actions follow or try, however badly, to follow the rules. They are imitative actions. But on the short path he becomes an individual living from the inside out. On the long path the man is preoccupied with techniques to be practiced and disciplines to be undergone. On the short path he is preoccupied with the over-self, with the study of its meaning, the remembrance of its presence, and the reflection upon its nature and attributes. The long path votary works from systems, rules, plans, and techniques, put down by its guides, but the short path votary has no path chalked out for him. He is forever waiting on the Lord. The long path brings the self to a growing awareness of its own strength, whereas the short path brings it to a growing awareness of its own unreality. This higher stage leads inevitably to a turnabout face where the energies are directed toward identification with the one infinite mind. The more this is done, the more grace flows by reaction into the self. The long path calls for a continued effort of the will, the short one for a continued loving attention. The long path developed in him through yoga meditation the capacity to find the inner stillness. The short path added to it. One, the knowledge that the stillness is himself, and two, the practice of continuing remembrance to be the stillness. The long path is arranged in progressive stages, whereas the short path is not. It points to direct, immediate, and final enlightenment. The long path is devoted to clearing away the obstructions in man's nature and to attacking the errors in his character. The short path is devoted to affirmatives, to the God power as essence and in manifestation. It is mystical. It shows how the individual can come into harmonious relation with the over-self and the world idea. The first path shows seekers how to think rightly. The second gives power to those thoughts. The long path practitioner looks upon illumination as something to be attained in the future when all requirements have been fully met, whereas the short path devotee looks upon it as attainable here and now. The long path is more easily practiced while engaged in the world, the short path while in retreat from it. The experiences which the vicissitudes of worldly life bring him also develop him, provided he is a quester but the lofty themes of his meditations on the short path require solitary places and unhurried leisurely periods. The long path sets up an attitude of yearning, whereas the short path considers the spirit an ever-present fact and consequently there is no need to yearn for it. The long path wants to purify and perfect the ego, but the short path wants to find God. The long path deals with the little pieces of a design, but the short path deals with the pattern itself. The long path takes one minor theme after another, but the short one takes up the main underlying theme alone. It is also the difference as well as distance between the immediate goal and the ultimate goal. The long path follower with his strenuous concern for self-improvement his compelling anxiety for self-advancement to fulfill the inner purposes of life may make life more difficult than it need be and himself become more humorless. The short path follower 
can afford to forget his past struggles and begin to enjoy life. The long way is also called the earth path. The short way is also called the sun path. This is because the earth is subject to gloomy seasonal changes, but the sun never varies in its radiance. If the long path is somewhere austere, the short one is notably joyous. The short path depends on naturalness and spontaneity, quite the opposite of the long path's discipline and effort. The individual who turns aside from the latter at the right moment does so not because he spurns them, or denies them, or rejects them, but because they do not serve him now. On the short path, he becomes aware of the fact of forgiveness. He leaves out the constant self-criticism and self-belittling, the painstaking self-improvement practices of the other path and begins to take full note of this saving fact. While the long path man is busy working about the evil in himself and in the world, the short path man is busy smiling at the good in the overself and in the world idea. There is no wish in the short path man to be better than he is, no desire to improve his character or purify his mind, no sense of being obliged to rectify the distortions brought about by the ego in both thought and feeling. Wu Wei has a double meaning. First, letting life, mind, act through you by yourself, becoming still, thought-free, and empty of ego. You are then not doing anything but being done to being used. Second, pursuing truth impersonally. The usual ways seek personal attainment, achievement, and salvation. The aspirant thinks or speaks of my mind, or my purification, or my progress. Hence, such ways are self enclosed, egotistic. Whatever repression of the ego that there is occurs only on the surface and merely drives it down to hide in the subconscious, whence it will reemerge later. These methods are long path ones, hence are destined to end in futility and despair. The deeper way, a wu way, is to lose the ego by doing nothing to seek truth or to improve oneself adopting no practice, following no path. The short path turns realization over to over-self so that it is not your concern any longer. This does not mean that you do not care whether you find truth or not, but that whereas ordinary care for it arises out of desire of the ego or anxiety of the ego or egotistic need of comfort, escape or relief, short path care arises out of the stillness of mind the serenity of faith, and the acceptance of this universe.